Did the judge go along with the prosecutor's request to move the Chad Day Bell trial back to Eastern Idaho? The uh, Jonathan Majors, a quick trial update, and uh, an explanation of what experts can and cannot testify to in trial. An example of some poor behavior by two high school students, uh, one will absolutely shock you. A man who had multiple domestic violence incidents is alleged to have finally killed his wife that he cared so deeply for. And then finally, our dumb criminal of the day. Let's talk about it. Good day, everyone. My name is Scott Reich, and this is Crime Talk. Thanks for joining us. You know the drill. Subscribe if you haven't. Like if you do. Leave me a comment below and hit that little bell for notifications when we go live or put up new content. And remember, you can listen to us anytime on any of your favorite podcasting apps. Now, I want to give a big shout out to all of you and say thank you. We just hit the 250,000. That's right, a quarter of a million subscribers. Still have a long way to go to get to a million but we're making some progress. It's funny when, uh, when you get out of YouTube jail that uh, suddenly you start getting subscribers back again. Funny how that works. All right, let's go ahead and uh, open the record for December 11th, 2023. And first on the docket, there's been some significant rulings as it relates to the Chad Day Bell case. Now, the first one I wanna talk about, and frankly is not surprising, is the motion to reconsider the change of venue that was filed by the prosecution. Now, just a quick procedural background for those who aren't familiar with the case. Back on May 24th of 2021, a Fremont County jury returned an indictment charging uh, Chad Daybell and his co-conspirator, Lori Vallow, with multiple crimes, including multiple counts of conspiracy to commit the crimes of first degree murder. Daybell was also charged with uh, several counts of first degree murder and insurance fraud. Then, on July 21st of 2021, Chad DeBell filed a motion requesting a change of venue. The state objected to that request, and on September 29th, 2021, that was filed. And then on October 5th, the court heard arguments and received evidence on the motion, and the court entered an order granting the defendant's motion for a change of venue. And that's kind of significant. That's where we, 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 we were moving from Fremont County up to Ada County. And... Um, the court goes through kind of legal standards analysis, but I think the uh, analysis that the court put in its motion is probably by far the most ex best explanation as to why the court did it. So as a prefatory comment, the court will clarify the issue at bar. Defendant argues it is procedurally inappropriate and flawed for the state to request a change of venue. However, the record reflects the correct posture of the pending motion. The state is asking the court to reconsider the decision to transfer trial from Fremont County to Ada County and return the trial proceedings to Fremont County. Given that procedural posture, the court finds that the state's motion is appropriately considered and will be determined on the merits over the procedural objections of the defense. From the outset, this case has garnered significant media attention. Daybell's alleged co-conspirators was tried and convicted on all charges brought by the state against her. Now, while her trial was not televised, daily release of the audio was repackaged and broadcast by various media entities. Therefore, the analysis before the court is under Criminal Rule 21, whether the court is satisfied that a fair and impartial trial cannot be had in Ada County, where the case is currently set, to reconsider bringing it trial back to Fremont County. The state argues the trial of Lori Vallow conducted in Ada County, uh, Fremont County case number uh, 22-21-1624, was heavily covered across various media platforms in Boise and Ada County, and that the more recent media saturation there now poses the risk that the jury pool for Day Bell's trial in that venue is likely tainted. The state suggests that given the trial publicity in Ada County earlier this year, Fremont County may now be a better venue for locating a fair and impartial jury. To support this argument, the state referenced the media coverage in Ada County, but did not provide further empirical evidence to demonstrate that media coverage during the trial of Lori Vallow's uh, trial had been so saturated the prospective jurors in Ada County that it was unlikely to impanel a fair and impartial jury. In fact, no additional evidence has been presented in support of the motion, which rests solely on argument. While the court may draw its own reasonable inferences based on the experience of residing in Boise during the trial earlier this year, such inferences are not as compelling as empirical evidence 
that could have been submitted in support of the state's motion. Neither has the state demonstrated how that same extensive coverage has not also continued to inform and interest the prospective jurors in Fremont County or any neighboring county in the 7th Judicial District. As the court mentioned at the hearing, it is likely that the sentence of Lori Vallow Daybell on July 31, 2023, was the apex of the media coverage and public interest and that the hearing occurred in Fremont County. That hearing is also chronologically the most recent major event garnering such coverage in either case. The court will reiterate its, its position relating to the ability to conduct the trial in Fremont County. Absent the concerns of locating a fair and impartial jury, the court has total and unequivocal confidence the trial in Fremont County would pose no concern. This court presides over all felony cases and all district court civil cases in Fremont County. The court has conducted many trials in Fremont County. Never has this court found Fremont County jurors to be unable to honorably serve and faithfully discharge their directives to follow the law and instructions of the court to uphold a defendant's right to a jury trial with a fair and unbiased jury. In addition, any concerns raised over courthouse security or ongoing construction of the adjoining jail facility are without merit. The Fremont County Sheriff's Office is fully capable and competent to oversee a trial of this magnitude. The office has always provided exemplary security for the court, whether at routine criminal hearing days or during heavily attended and emotionally charged hearings such as Lori Vallow's sentencing hearing, where heightened security risks are present. Further, that office provided personal security for the court beyond expectation during the entire course of the first trial in Ada County. Regarding the physical facilities, the Fremont County Courthouse is notably beautiful and historic facility. The clerks are dedicated, experienced, and responsive. To summarize, absent the concern about selecting an impartial jury, not tainted by pretrial publicity, Fremont County would unquestionably be an ideal venue for the upcoming trial. Nevertheless, the objective considerations of the sheer population differences between Fremont County and Ada County cannot be ignored. As demonstrated in the companion case, a large number of prospective jurors will be necessary to summon, qualify, and question through the use of a questionnaire and both group and individual voir dire in order to ensure that the balance tips in the favor of robust due process to Daybell, particularly in light of the potential for capital punishment. The state has presented no evidence to ameliorate any concern that the pervasive media coverage has not inundated Fremont County jurors with pretrial exposure in Daybell's case, an actual exposure to the presentation of the evidence at trial in Valley Daybell's case, of which the proffer to the court is that there will be significant overlap in witness testimony and other evidence. In addition, Ironically, the sheer expense of litigating the case and the companion case has impacted Fremont County financially. That financial impact becomes another source of potential jury taint that hardworking citizens of the county are likely frustrated and that the prospect of paying for these cases resulting in further interest in following these cases, even those citizens are less interested in the subject of the case. The court has carefully considered the unfortunate reality that there will be additional expense in again moving this second trial to Ada County. Finally, the court must consider the empirical evidence that it does have before it, that Ada County, the most populous county in Idaho, has the resources from a jury selection standpoint to impanel an impartial jury and is willing to provide the facility to conduct the trial. The reality is, and the state would likely concede, that nearly every reasonable eligible working citizen of Fremont County capable of jury service has followed the Chad Day Bell and Lori Vallow story. The discovery of JJ and Tylee, and Tylee Ryan's buried bodies on Chad Day Bell's Fremont County property sent shockwaves through the community and propelled the case into the national spotlight. While the expense of conducting trial in Boise is immense it is less expensive than attempting and failing to seat a jury at Fremont County only to thereafter return to Ada County. Unfortunately, the court finds that scenario to be a distinct possibility. Finally, the state requests to consider alternative locations closer in proximity are not unreasonable. However, the extensive preparation and time involved administratively has been expended to prepare preparing for trial in Ada County. At this time, with only a few months before trial begins, it would be impracticable, if not impossible, to pivot to an alternative county and begin anew the complex machinations of administering a case 
that this magnitude and complexity. The logistics of hosting this trial, including the sheer length of the trial, place a burden on the hosting county. Taking over a main uh, courtroom for months creates issues requiring extensive planning and preparation. Additionally, and again, on the consideration of cost, the court will note that Ada County made significant concessions that lessened the fiscal impact on Fremont County relating to the trial costs. It is unlikely that other counties would be willing or able to extend such concessions, especially on short notice. Thus, the court is not convinced that it would be any less expensive to host a trial in an alter alternative county. The court recognizes the sacrifices that are required given the difficult situation. For local prosecutors, there is a burden of having to re relocate away from family and community for an extended time. The burden extends to others, including witnesses, victims, families, and law enforcement involving the security staff. The court decision to allowing the live streaming of the trial will serve to lessen that burden to some extent. Notwithstanding, the court remains convinced that the proper venue for trial remains Ada County and that a fair and impartial jury will take place there as was accomplished in the companion case earlier this year. Therefore, the state's renewed motion to reconsider change of venue is denied. Now, the significance of that is the court notes is we've always talked about. It. It's always about the money. In this particular case, that's what it's really about. The prosecutors want to do it close to home because it's expensive to pack up and go do a trial on the other side of the state. Trust me, I've done that. It is expensive. You got to come up with lodging, food for not only you, but your staff that's coming with you to trials, staff, etc. So that's what it really boils down to. And the judge also noted that the prosecution failed to present any empirical data which would say that basically people in Fremont County are not aware of this situation at all. They didn't conduct that research because they know that it would be not accurate, would not come out in their favor. So therefore, that is why they um, are doing that the way they're doing it. They're, they have no data. And the court said, you didn't present me with any new data. Therefore, you know, we're going to do this in Ada County. It makes sense. Um, the next uh, order was the uh, defendant's motion limited to limit the state to consistent argument on defendant's relative culpability. As you may recall, in the trial of Lori Vallow, the prosecutors stated that Lori Vallow was the mastermind, the manipulator uh, throughout the trial, and that everything was done at her request. The killing of her children, uh, the killing of Tammy Daybell, everything was done at her request. Well, obviously the defense in this case, Chad Daybell, likes that idea. That's what I said early on in this case. You have to say that he was manipulated by this woman, what have you, but he didn't know the extent of what she and her brother, uh, Alex Cox, were in fact doing. So the defense files a motion and says, hey, Judge, we just want to make sure it's clear that the prosecution should have to maintain the same theory of prosecution and say that Lori Valla was the leader, the mastermind behind everything that took place here as it relates to the death of Tylee, JJ, as well as Tammy Daybell. And the court denies it uh, based upon the record that was uh, created. And um, the defense can revisit the issue if something arises at trial. Now, for an attorney to go in and argue, let's say on day one, that a particular position should go forward and then go do it in a different case, like not related, that's okay. I have a bit of a problem. I mean, the, the, the prosecution's duty is to achieve justice. That's in the ethical standards for prosecutors, not to obtain convictions. And it's a little disingenuous when you do one trial saying that Lori Vallow was the manipulator, the mastermind, the leader, and then they're going to flip to this trial and say, Chad Daybell was the manipulator, the mastermind, the leader of everything that took place. You have to admit it's a little disingenuous, but the court's going to allow the prosecutor to do that to a certain extent. We'll see if the issue comes up. Like I said, is it going to be a huge appellate issue? No. The prosecution has their theory of uh, prosecution that they want to go forward on, and uh, so be it. But I just think it's interesting uh, the inconsistencies that are taking place there by the prosecution. And then finally, uh, the court issued a an amended Notice the pretrial setting. Obviously, we have a trial starting on April 1st, 2024. Oh, yeah, and Lori Vallow has her trial in Arizona beginning on April 4th, 2024. Hmm. It's going to be interesting, particularly if they actually both go at the same time. 
pretty sure Chad Day Bell will go with this, on schedule this time. There's no more need for continuances any further in this case. The uh, one in Arizona, Lori Val will probably get a continuance in that, but it's probably her only shot is to demand her right to a speedy trial. So there you go. There's the latest news as it relates to Chad Day Bell. They're going to stay in Ada County. Now, we flew up there. We jumped in Crime Talk 1 uh, last time and went and checked out uh, the trial of Lori Vallow. I'm assuming we'll do the same. Uh, we'll just have to wait and see. Uh, I think the judge made the right decision. Uh, small community. Everyone's going to know everybody. And, um, you know, just just do it right. Just take the larger jury pool and try to get 12 people that know little to nothing about the case so that it is a fair trial. And then if Chad DeBell is convicted and if they go forward on the the uh, death penalty, so be it. And one of the things in the pretrial order is that all discovery, all discovery, which remember is the reason why Lori Vallow had the death penalty taken off because the prosecution had not turned over all discovery. And in this particular case, all discovery needs to be turned over no later than 5 p.m. on February 1st. If you don't turn over by that date, guess what? You don't get to use it. Next, the Jonathan Majors trial continues. And the court ruled on what experts can and cannot testify to at trial. So the Jonathan Majors assault trial is uh, has resumed today. And uh, obviously, there was, there was a break over the weekend. Well, an expert on domestic violence was scheduled to testify. But the judge who is presiding over the proceedings has issued some limiting instructions on what an expert can say. And I must say, I think the judge got it right. The court will not allow testimony that false allegations of domestic violence are incredibly rare. And the uh, expert um, also cannot testify that because a person exhibited certain behavior, that person is a victim of domestic violence. So why is that significant? Now, this, this Majors case is pretty straightforward. It's a fight between Majors and his girlfriend where she's saying that her hand was injured. He's saying, I did nothing wrong. And ultimately, she goes off and uh, parties with some strangers that basically befriended her. She didn't complain. She danced, etc. She's fine. And so the prosecution is bringing in their little expert off the shelf to say, hey, I'm a domestic violence person. Uh, I'm an expert witness, probably some sort of psychologist, to say that uh, somebody uh, exhibited certain behavior, um, and that would be indicative of somebody being a victim of domestic abuse. Well, we run into this oftentimes in um, assault cases of the sexual nature where they say, well, if somebody didn't report a, uh, an assault immediately, uh, that means they must be telling the truth. But then you have other people say, oh, well, if they didn't tell anybody for weeks, months, years, decades, that, that also is indicative of somebody uh, that, has, uh, that is telling the truth. Now, remember, experts can't testify as to the truthfulness of somebody, but they have tried to use this for years, and they got away with it for so long. And um, probably one of the greatest cross-examinations I ever did was I went through the list of everything that the expert said could be indicative of somebody being the victim of a sexual abuse. And then we went through, well, it says this particular area, this could be something else. Oh, you're getting poor grades in school. Uh, you know, you're, uh, you're acting out, you're running away. There's lots of reasons that can explain that other than someone was, in fact, the victim of a sexual abuse. Now, am I saying that sexual abuse doesn't take place? Oh, no. I've, I've seen it, ladies and gentlemen. There's more than you could possibly imagine. But when it comes to court, that's for the jury to decide and not having an expert get up there and say, well, this is what uh, this means. And uh, therefore, um, you must believe the complaining witness or not believe the complaining witness. That's for the jury to decide, ladies and gentlemen. And like I said, prosecutors and even some defense have tried to use this to their advantage. Courts are clamping down on it very hard uh, because, well, it's prejudicial, it's inappropriate, and it is simply invading the province of the jury. Next, some bad behavior by two high school students. First one, a high school basketball player and his brother were arrested uh, earlier this month after they assaulted the that's right, the head coach who benched the 17-year-old player for bad behavior during the game. Jevin Allen, who played for the Willis High School, was benched during the game at the Conroe High School for his behavior towards the opposing player. But he and his family returned to 
Willis uh, to wait for the coach, according to the uh, sheriffs there. And the coach arrived after the game and entered the school. And Allen and his family confronted him when he came back out to the parking lot. The confrontation started as a verbal altercation, but Allen allegedly then punched the coach and uh, was joined by his 22-year-old brother, Jarek Allen. Another coach witnessed the assault, and uh, he, along with the, another bystander, broke up the fight, and then all the kids ran. Well, the Montgomery County deputies uh, reviewed video surveillance and interviewed witnesses and noted that the victim had injuries to his head, neck, face, and arms, and then the deputies tracked down the brothers and arrested them for assault on a public servant. They were released after posting a $23,000 bond. Now, the Willis Independent School District said the coach is recovering and that Allen is no longer enrolled at the school because they learned he didn't live in the district. I think that's kind of interesting. The kid that was the player that got benched didn't live in the district, so he shouldn't even been playing there in the first place. Why? Probably because the coach wanted the kid. He was a good athlete. I don't know. Just follow the rules, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, don't get me wrong. I know there's two. There's a lot of rules out there, but just common sense ones, that's what they're there for. Anyway, the uh, police did say the investigation is ongoing, and uh, we did determine that the student's address was no longer valid, so he had been withdrawn from the district. And uh, the school district also noted that they were deeply saddened by this incident and will not tolerate behavior from students like that. Well, you think that was bad behavior. Wait till you hear about this kid, 17 years old. Jonathan Martinez Garcia was sentenced to 40 years in prison after he ambushed the teacher, identified only as Sadie, by asking if he could speak about his grades at the El Dorado High School back in April of 2022. Well, there's surveillance footage that begins about 1.33 in the afternoon on this day where this assault took place. And it shows Martinez Garcia wandering the halls of the school. He tries and fails to gain access to a classroom. Then he starts walking back down the hallway. Well, he then turns around and walks back to the classroom. Sadie's head pops out of the room, apparently talking to the student. Then the video cuts to her struggling with Martinez Garcia in the doorway and being dragged back into her classroom. The video resumes about 3.05 p.m., an hour and a half after the suspect walked into the classroom. And Martinez Garcia leaves the school with his head down. Now, during his uh, sentencing, it was revealed that the student knocked the teacher unconscious. She later woke up with her pants and underwear down before the uh, student threatened to burn her alive, according to prosecutors. And at one point in the attack, Martinez Garcia told her, why can't you just die already? Now, the teacher was strangled from behind with cord during the attack had her wrists cut, and obviously she suffers from chronic pain and post-traumatic stress disorder, needing a walker to move around. Now, the uh, teenager smirked in court while his uh, victim was recounting her terrifying experience, and he later, he later made the same expression when he received his ultimate sentence. Sadie, the victim, told the judge that she believed she was going to die during the horrific ordeal that left her covered in bruises. Sadie told the sentencing hearing judge she has been imprisoned both mentally and physically, and it only makes sense that he too should be in prison for as long as possible. Um, Sadie's mother also spoke at the sentencing hearing and told the judge that her daughter used to be a gregarious woman who came from a family of educators and had moved to Vegas to begin her first teaching job. But since the attack, she has had difficulty leaving her home because of ongoing physical and mental health complications. And for the rest of her life, her memory of teaching is going to be that the student tried to kill her. Well, the prosecutors noted that the uh, teacher remembers Martinez Garcia saying repeatedly, why don't you die? Sadie told the judge that she did not return to her teaching job after the attack because she felt mentally and physically imprisoned. Martinez Garcia fled after the attack and took the teacher's keys. The instructor was later found by a, uh, another school employee who called 911. The teen was arrested shortly after by school police while he was on his way to an award ceremony at the school. Now, Martinez Garcia's public defender uh, argued that his behavior was caused by severe side effects of an asthma medication called Singulair, which apparently caused mood changes, night terrors, and hallucinations. And the singular manufacturer, a company called Merck, 
Ever heard of him? Yep, we all have. Is facing um, lawsuits that allege the company covered up links between its asthma drug and the severe effects on patients' mental health. But the district attorney noted that he does not believe the side effects of the medication was any valid reason for the attacks. So we brought you the story today because, I mean, youth, kids, what are you doing? But I think that story was significant because it shows the impact, particularly violent crime impact has on people. They remember that. It doesn't go away like you go take a shower and it's done. It will always be there with you. The fear, uh, the intimidation that takes place, the feeling of safety, the lack of safety that people feel, it is a real thing. So when violent criminals are let off, they don't realize the continuing uh, effect that it has on the victims. Let me know, do, do you agree or disagree with me? So then we have another story of a, well, another man behaving poorly. Um, accused of uh, killing his ex-girlfriend uh, that he'd had, you know, several DV incidents for. Gee, not like you saw that coming, did you? What do we say? Past performance is indicative of future results? Anyway, the man accused of killing his ex-girlfriend days after getting out of jail in a domestic abuse case where he beat her has now been indicted for her murder. Um, a grand jury in Minnesota indicted Matthew Scott Brennan, on one count of first degree murder and two counts of second degree murder in the death of Danica Bergenson, according to the Hennepin County attorney. Now the first degree murder stems from uh, the alleged conduct of committing domestic abuse with a pattern of domestic abuse. And the second degree murder charge comes from committing a felony and while under a restraining order for a protection order. And the officers uh, from the Hopkins Police Department were called on July 8th to an apartment after a downstairs neighbor heard yelling and banging coming from the uh, apartment above them. When the police entered the apartment, they found Brenneman inside the bathroom with a strong odor of bleach because he apparently attempted to drink it and attempt to take his own life. Well, officers originally arrested him on a second degree murder charge, but Bergenson was found in her bed wrapped in blankets and a plastic garbage bag covered with abrasions and bruising all over her body. Investigators believe that she'd probably been dead for at least a day, and Brennan also allegedly wrote incriminating letters that were located near Bergenson's body. Should we give you a kind of sample of some of those letters? I do not wish to divulge what all transpired, personal things elusive to Bergenson and myself, to know or seem as though I'm trying to justify many terrible, absurd, or unacceptable things that happened between us. He's alleged to have written, I never loved any woman as I was romantically involved with as profoundly and honestly as Bergenson. Yes, because that's what you do. You People you love, you beat them up and ultimately kill them, allegedly. We'll give him the presumption of innocence. Then in another letter, he apologized for the crude way in which her body was found, according to uh, police affidavits. And um, next one was, things happened abruptly, he allegedly wrote. I didn't know what to do and tried to go on a couple of days. I can't try to live after this. The end, Matthew. There were also several drafts of letters, including one where he reportedly said that he feels sadness, guilt, remorse, shame, and regret. I'm very sad and remorseful about all of this, but it is what it is, he allegedly wrote. I'm deeply sorry for Bergenson's family, friends, and my own family and friends. Brenneman's attorney uh, has filed a motion to uh, dismiss the case on the charges on the grounds that the medical examiner could not determine a cause and manner of death. The attorney noted that the autopsy notes that there were no significant injuries to the head, neck, or any evidence of suffocation or strangulation. And uh, as for the letters, well, Brenneman's attorney says they're ambiguous and they're not an admission of guilt anyway. Uh, his attorney writes that the prosecutor will likely argue that uh, her client put uh, Bergenson in a chokehold that does not leave marks, but she said someone would have to have training on how to complete the chokehold, which her client does not have. The judge has uh, yet to rule on the motion, but I'm guessing, I'm guessing it's going to be denied. Now, the police also noted several prior domestic violence incidents between the two. One happened on April 24th when uh, Brenneman allegedly punched and bit Bergenson, later saying she effing deserved it. The other occurred on May 13th when uh, he punched, bit, and choked the victim while saying he was going to kill her. He pled guilty and was released from jail on June 27th, just 11 days before she was found dead again. Funny how that works. And you know she had a protection order too, didn't you? Wow, because that's right. 
those protection orders, they're worth as much as the piece of paper they're written on. They're useless. You need to protect yourself, ladies and gentlemen. Protect yourself. I don't know how many times we've stressed it. It is a dangerous world out there. I've seen lots of bad, bad things. People think that we, everyone walks around with rose-colored glasses thinking it's all going to be okay if we just give everybody a big hug. No, ladies and gentlemen, evil exists in the world. And fortunately for us, dumb people also exist in the world. Otherwise, we wouldn't have our last segment of the day, our dumb criminal of the day. Well, police allege that Anthony Michael Lessa was apparently intoxicated when he caused a disturbance at a restaurant called Rick's Reef down in St. Petersburg. Now, the police allege that he was uh, throwing gator nuggets. Gator nuggets, you might add. Well, apparently it is a a combination of uh, a chicken nugget looking like food item, but made of alligator meat. Anyway, he was uh, throwing the nuggets when an employee's uh, note confronted Les about throwing the nuggets, and um, he became belligerent and advanced on a life-size manatee. Not a real manatee, but a life-size manatee. Um, what did he do with the life-size manatee? Did he throw those alligator nuggets? No. To the shock and somewhat amusement of onlookers, Lessa then went on to attempt to sexually molest the mannequin of the Manatee, which has been known to wear a T-shirt promoting the consumption of tacos. Well, I'm going to say a criminal complaint does uh, further describe the alleged molestation of the manatee, but he was not charged. Now, after running from the uh, restaurant, Lessa police caught up with charged him with causing a disturbance at a nearby hotel where he yelled and cursed at a front desk worker and stood in the parking lot yelling obscenities. When the police arrived at the scene, Lessa exhibited multiple signs of intoxication and kept asking why he was being arrested. Well, like I said, ultimately charged with disorderly intoxication disturbance, Les was booked in the jail on the misdemeanor account, and he was released early Saturday morning. Now, according to Les's uh, social media pages, he is a, guess what, a student pilot. Well, at least he wasn't on shrooms, or maybe he was, but at least he had enough sense to not do it in the cockpit. But Mr. Lessa, you are a dumb criminal of the day. Don't go around wasting good food, throwing it at a restaurant, and then attacking a life-size mannequin of a manatee? Is there no justice in the world? I don't know, ladies and gentlemen. I mean, common sense. Common sense. Well, Mr. Lessa, good luck getting that uh, pilot's license. You're going to have to explain this one away. Anyway, thanks for watching. I hope everyone enjoyed the show today. Have a wonderful day. And remember, the Constitution matters.